Many prominent Nigerians are already coming out to analyze the Independence Day speech that was delivered by President Bola Metinubu. The speech writer um, definitely had a very difficult time, but obviously when you look at the body polity, you look at the situation within Nigeria today, um, what do you write for the president to say to Nigerians at a time like this, when obviously all we see are the challenges that face us. So the speechwriter struggled, and the struggles came across, came throughout um, the speech. We keep hearing different figures. Uh, Senator will come out today and say, they pay me uh, 13 million a month, and that person will deny it. So we, please, uh, I, think, I think there's a mistake on the part of the National Assembly. I think they should come out in the open and tell Nigerians how much is the salary of these lawmakers. I'm one of them is Kachuku. He is out now to let us know that the president's independence day speech failed to address the critical issues that is bedeviling the nation. He has also, however, noted that the speechwriter was just doing paparazzi to satisfy the president and tell Nigeria what they would love to hear. That the critical issues were left on touch. The speech writer um, definitely had a very difficult time, but obviously when you look at the body polity, you look at the situation within Nigeria today, um, what do you write for the president to say to Nigerians at a time like this, when obviously all we see are the challenges that face us. So the speech writer struggled and the struggles came across, came throughout um, the speech. So the president took us back down memory lane, uh, lane uh, to, uh, to the creation of Nigeria and talked about our founding fathers and what we should look forward to, what we should expect. But what surprised me the most about the speech that the critical issue facing Nigerians and all Nigerians today is the vexatious issue of um, subsidy re removal and the cost of fuel the rising prices of um, uh, goods and services in Nigeria, and the president did not address that in his speech. And I sh I'm sure for a lot of people, um, that caused a lot of um, anxiety. Um, um, the president uh, devoted, uh, I think, a paragraph and a half to security, where I must say that um, it's uh, clear that the, the, this, uh, uh, the presidency, they are doing uh, um, a quite a good job in um, taking on the fight to... Um, uh, to the terrorists um, in the northwest and the northeast, um, you, you can see that it's no longer business as usual where it seems that people could just waltz in, in through the borders of our country and take on the sovereign nation, or it's clear that we're taking the fight to these people now. So that's obvious. So that's one major achievement of um, uh, Tinubu's administration, but he just devoted a paragraph and a half to that. You know, he devoted four paragraphs, four paragraphs to the youths tensions it will always boil down to implementation and we can see that the failure of this government is in the area of implementation mm -hmm. so he speaks about the youths they have a national youth fund about 110 billion naira and the ministry of youths and if you ask about implementation implementation today I, I don't believe it's up to 10 percent i don't believe they are they are really doing much there there are a lot of areas where all the good policies that the president comes up with speaks about and when you speak about implementation, you don't see that they are being implemented as seriously. So this is what frustrates Nigerians. Um, every day, um, as a business owner myself, um, they recently passed the minimum wage bill, 70,000 naira now. And we have been told it's, clear, it's against the law for you to pay anyone less than that. The issue is how are businesses going to cope with that? What are they supposed to do? Businesses are folding up. I felt that the economy should have been addressed squarely. Whatever policies, programs, plans that the president has for the economy should have been addressed squarely. This was a good opportunity for him to tell us exactly what, instead of speaking in general terms, he should have given us specifics as to what he was going to do to fix the economy. I felt that the speech was lacking in that. Like I said when I started, the speech writer definitely had a difficult time crafting this speech because the issues are very 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 serious and obviously it's difficult to try and take a lot of these things in one speech tell that you have taken time to 
scrutinize Mr. President's speech, identifying what you call the great omission about uh, the price of fuel. But when you say, when you ask the question, we ask the question, how will businesses uh, survive? I thought you provided that answer um, in your daily nugget, uh, which you shared some 10 hours ago. According to you, uh, I think you were asking the question of how do we survive? And you're saying it is now a world of needs and not wants. This should be the question every one of us should ask before we make any purchase. Do I need this or do I want it? Um, is that more or less like um, a comic relief for you? Or you think that Nigerians can really understand that position as to how to cope in this time? Uh, brilliant. I, I love the fact that you brought my uh, nuggets of today up. And um, yes, at a time like this, like it's happening all over the world when uh, economies are struggling, people have got to make plans. What's your plan B? You need to cut, you need to cut costs. That's the smartest thing to do. Now, if people are cutting costs in order to survive the grueling economy, the government should also be cutting costs. But the people are frustrated because they don't see the government to be cutting costs. So you understand the dilemma of the Nigerian people. So we know what we should be doing. We are trying our best. People have downgraded from three meals to a meal a day. Some people do two meals in two days. So people are doing whatever they can because they must survive. But what is the government doing to show that they are in tandem with the Nigerian people? I think this is the disconnect people have with the government. I always say this, any president, even if, if, president, uh, uh, if we had a president, Pito Obi or a president Atiku or a president Mimi Kachiku, any president at a time like this will struggle because Nigeria in the year 2024 is facing critical multifaceted issues. And you cannot solve these problems in one day or one year. You can also not solve these problems if you don't have the Nigerian people working in tandem with you. So I have always said the first task of this president is to bring all Nigerians together under the green, white, green, of our flag. Nigerians are still fighting or reeling over the last elections where you have a large group of Nigerians who have, are still feeling vexed or injured about the outcome of the elections and the president has not shown what I call leadership in managing that issue, in bringing these people under his family, under his umbrella, to say, whereas the, um, these elections didn't go how you expected it, but I need you guys to work with me to make Nigeria work again. It's like the president has all these schemes that he's doing for Nigerians, but the Nigerians are not with the president. They are not showing signs that they are supporting his government. And we all have a role to play in making Nigeria work. Those people who don't want to work with the president are destroying Nigeria. A president who doesn't understand that these people are not working with him, who needs to bring them under the, under the roof, he's also not doing right. So our roof keeps on leaking, and we are facing the same problems every day. So yes, he's doing a good job in areas of security. Yes, he's doing a good job in, youth, in his youth-centric efforts, in his social schemes, in disbursing money. But it's one thing to disburse money. It's another thing for the money to get to the people that the money has been disbursed for. We saw how much the last government disbursed in the area of agriculture but, and how much the CBN disbursed. But when you look at it, when you've checked the figures, do the monies get to the farmers or to the farms? No. So that's what these presidents have to critically look at. You see, for the last three weeks, one month, they've said they're going to change ministers. What does that do to the psyche of any minister? He stops working. He's afraid that he's going to lose his job, and not much is being done in the ministries today as we speak, because everybody's waiting to see what's going to happen. But action needs to be taken very, the, very fast so that Nigerians can feel a sense of relief. The expectation uh, for Mr. President is that um, if farmers are able to return to those areas, to those farmlands they left because of insecurity, it will boost production and eventually drive down the cost of living for many Nigerians. I think time would tell whether or not the speech was inspiring enough. One of the things you have said in one of your nuggets is the need for, uh, if our negative pull us, down, pull, pull us down, our positives must also pull us up. And we're going to see if Mr. President has been able to achieve that. But recently, you 
called for an end to the last protest due to loss of lives. And you saw in Mr. President's speech how it took time to express his intent to engage young people. I'm wondering what you think about President Tinobu's proposed 30-day youth conference and how you think that will address the challenges facing young people in Nigeria. Oh, I, I think that's a, that's a brilliant idea. Like I said, the president spent a better part of his speech addressing the youths. Obviously, this is in reaction to um, the recent protests and all the planned protests, okay? So the president understands that the youths are aggrieved, that the youths are vexed right now, and that he needs to do something. So, like I said, he's making grand and good plans in those directions. It always boils down to, um, it always boils down to the implementation. So I like the fact that he, keeps, he acknowledges that he needs to do something about youth who he said make up 60% of our population. I like the ideas, I like the things he's trying to do in those areas. Let's see about the implementation now. That's when we can then know if it's actually working. Like I mentioned, the president has already ongoing 110 billion national youth empowerment fund. Is that money being um, disbursed? How many people have benefited from that scheme? So the president is doing all of these things, noble things that he needs to do. But it's about the people who is entrusted to do these things. Are they doing what he has asked them to do? So schemes are good, ideas are good. It now boils down to the implementation. I always say this, like you, you mentioned yeah, and alluded to my, my daily nuggets. I speak daily about Nigerians' servitude, Nigerians doing their bit. They must work with government. They must support government. Government must, government is not um, in isolation or an island unto itself. The Nigerian people are, are a part of government. The people who work in government are Nigerians like you and I. There's nobody I know whose uh, who's, uh, name in his passport, his name in his passport is, is government. Government is made up of Nigerians like you and I. So the people in being disconnected from government or from Nigeria are causing harm to Nigeria. We all have a role to play in making Nigeria work for everyone. This government right now, the private sector is dealing with the huge, the huge Jackma syndrome. Companies are being affected. As people live every day in droves to other crimes, these are our best and brightest, our middle class who are living. So who is going to operate in the private sector? Who is going to operate in government? So Nigerians are making a mistake in that regard. But let me tell you something. I travel very frequently. Each time I'm coming back to this country, I see other people moving to Nigeria. Who are they? I see Lebanese, Syrians, the Turkish, the Chinese. I see people moving to Nigeria, coming to set up businesses in Nigeria, the same Nigeria where Nigerians are living, are, are, are living in droves. So these people are coming and they are forming part of our middle class. They are the people who are benefiting from a lot of the programs and policies of the government. Whereas Nigerians who should benefit are leaving. Because some people cannot, cannot choose to stay one extra day to be patient to see some of these policies work. What is government doing about this? We need to have a conversation, a conversation that is larger than the APC. It's a Nigerian conversation that involves all Nigerians. This, the president must first of all have a country before he can be president. And that's what I'm speaking about. Uh, but for many Nigerians, when they hear National Youth Conference, what comes to mind is the 2014 CONFAB. And what happened to that, even though Mr. President is promising to implement resolutions that would come from this one. But do you believe uh, this initiative uh, has the capacity to provide tangible solutions to issues like unemployment, economic empowerment, and education, or, or it's merely a symbolic gesture. Have you been able to identify what went wrong with the first one? Is there continuity in government to ensure that all of these resolutions are established and implemented? I will say this very quickly. I respect the questions you are asking. Um, um, the questions are very are questions that show that this is not just a conversation to be a conversation for having, uh, for sake of having a conversation. You are asking very very germane questions. Yes, I believe that this president is different from other presidents. I believe that he's going to implement um, whatever um, um, whatever policies or whatever decisions that that are, are reached. 
I see a president who, um, who is assiduously implementing financial autonomy for local governments. I see a president who understands the politics of Nigeria. In his speech, he used the phrase political economy, ec economy twice. The first time we're hearing this lexicon in our political speech, and a lot of people might not understand in two cases of, of, um, of um, that phrase that he has used. But I'm hoping that a president who understands this, who understands the inner workings of everything and how they translate to, the, to, to, the, uh, to our body polity as a whole, who understands that there are issues that um, militate against Nigeria beyond the A, Bs, and Cs, who will, will work quietly be in the background to, to make sure that some of the things that we can see, we can read about, but are working against us, that he fights those things. I believe that the president will do some of those things. But again, best ideas best of intentions he still needs people lieutenants who will run this race and that's where this the disconnect is today but you will say this of this government one thing you can take to the bank about this government is that it seems to be a government that reacts positively to a lot of things they see and hear on social media about what about nigeria's um about complaints of nigerians and all those things i love the fact that in the last two months or so two months or so this government has taken on the issue of the youths and their worries and they are doing a lot to speak about this to address this whereas a lot of the last the last our last president you can protest all you want to protest you are just uh, you, uh, you you have just probably planning about you know but we see this government responding you know Whereas they don't really, they can be like a former, former, former president, but they are responding, Indeed. which is good. You know, the reality is that opinions remain sharply divided as to the performance of this current government. Even though Mr. President uh, acknowledges the challenges Nigerians are faced with and is optimistic that his reforms are showing positive signs, people are still sharply divided as to, you know, the direction this administration has taken. My question, however, is... How do you think citizens can hold their leaders accountable for delivering on campaign promises? We've seen protests and how they turn sour. We've seen um, some other forms of civil disobedience that have impacted drastically on the economic reality of the Nigerian people. 64 years after independence, have we been able to come up with you know, acceptable formats of how Nigerians can call government to, you know, action without necessarily disrupting um, their governance? Well, that's what uh, social media means to this generation of Nigerians. But um, uh, the challenge we have is that uh, people don't use social media positively. Um, it seems that a large part of our population are more interested in using social media for skits and jokes. Um, I see sometimes when government is tweeting about something serious or something that affects the same youths who are complaining that these people, because they, they sometimes don't understand or sometimes don't know what government is talking about, they don't see how they can benefit. Perhaps that's why the um, National Youth Fund is not being disbursed because maybe a lot of Nigerians don't know about it. They would rather complain on social media. I also I always, uh, always say this, you know, I was part of student union movement. When people want to protest, when people want to go on strike, they don't give you notice. Youths don't give notice. The day they are fed up, they will go out on the streets. So I always say this, this so-called protest that we are seeing, our witnessing when they always give you 30 days notice and what have you, you know, these protests are just, um, uh, I, I, they are what I call a sham or a scam, you know. When the people are truly fed up, no one is going to tell them to go, out, uh, to go out and truly protest. So what we see are people who are bargaining in the background and doing a lot of stuff and all those things, you know. But it's good that this, the presidency and the president seems to um, talk to them and because people are truly, truly going through hard times. Um, uh, people, are, people are struggling. Businesses are closing. And what have you, you know, how do people protest? I would say one way of, one way of protesting is to start having more town halls to speak about these issues but beyond speaking about the issues we need to start focusing on solutions you will see that every time on social media you see things going viral it's about people complaining about what government has not done but you rarely see people speaking about solutions about what government needs to do solutions that work i spoke last time about the need to um about organizing town halls where we need to speak about solutions solution-centric town halls governments 
belongs to all Nigerians. If the country fails, we all fail. The reign of a bad economy is falling on all Nigerians. So Nigerians should be speaking about solutions and not problems. We engage too much in problems because when we speak about problems and people say something, they are angry, it goes viral. We need to start making solutions go viral so we can have solutions to our dilapidated infrastructure. We can have solutions to our failing economy. We can have solutions to creating employment for our youth. We can have solutions to making sectors that used to be vibrant, like the textile sector, making them vibrant once again. We can have solutions to our, 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 our pipe um, crude oil theft. We can have solutions to the myriad issues. Our, our, our um, education sector that just seems to be going downhill every day. We I agree. Don't start speaking solutions I agree for all these things. It, the, yes. the government will, will listen. From what is in the public uh, in the public domain, uh, legislators have not been living up to expectation. They might have been trying in their own way, but perception is for those of us in the media. Perception is what is important. Where there's a perception that they work more for themselves or for the country, then that's a problem there. The issue of their salary and uh, monthly income is a thing of long debates. And, um, people think that they are, they are not transparent enough. Aladisu Amosu was retired when Nigeria attained independence in 1960. He has been a parliamentary reporter for over 10 years. Mr. Amosu and his journalist colleagues speak on the evolution of the National Assembly. Over the years, I have been opportunity to cover the parliament both at the state and national level. I think if they've been trying their best, no doubt about that, you have to be in there to know their contributions to national development. We keep hearing different figures. Uh, Senator will come out today and say, they pay me uh, 30 million a month, and that person will deny it. So please, uh, I, think, I think there's a mistake on the part of the National Assembly. I think they should come out in the open and tell Nigerians how much is the salary of these lawmakers. I'm talking But did they support a unicameral legislature and return to a parliamentary system of government? I think I would still prefer the one that has been operated now because um, it might even be worse when you go to parliamentary where you have few people representing. We are so much in Nigeria. You can't have few people representing about over 200 million people. In terms of saving costs, that may have a point, but that's not everything, you know. The Senate, the House of Reps, they have their, each have their own way of going about government. Democracy, the way we're practicing is too expensive for the kind of economy that we are running. And so a unicameral something would be better for the country so that um, we reduce costs and then uh, be able to deploy such funds. To other things. Let's talk about the principle of separation of powers. You've been at the, you've been a parliamentarian. Now you are now occupying the executive seats. In the last 25 years, how would you describe the separation of power in the country? Thank you very much, my brother. I, I think uh, as someone who had an experience board as a former legislature as well as now in the executive arm of the government. I can say that uh, the Port Republic, which we are experiencing at this critical time, uh, which is a previous system of government, is the best system of government as far as I'm concerned. And of course, uh, I can say that uh, at least we have, at least, uh, we are now experiencing about 24 years on, uh, of uh, uninterrupted uh, civilian uh, democratic government in the history of Nigeria, which for me is uh, something that we all have to continue to build on some of the successes we've achieved in the last 24 years. Of course, uh, I also believe that uh, Nigeria is work in progress. There are a lot of things that needs to be looked into. Uh, we need to make a lot of uh, effort to improve certain things. Uh, democracy, as you are aware, is a system that uh, needs improvement almost on a daily basis. And of course, the National Assembly, that's the legislature, have a very critical role to play in entrenching democracy in the country as well as ensuring that uh, there's check and balance. And of course, uh, judiciary also, as one of the most important arm of the government, have to also step up and uh, do what is right because as far as I'm concerned, 
a democracy system of government where people have to be given uh, what is due to them in terms of not only about development, but the fundamental human rights. Uh, people have a right to certain things that are basic, and that can only happen in a democratic setting. But of course, uh, in a democratic setting, if there's no check and balance, there will be abuses also. So what I can say here is that uh, stakeholders must all come together, the journalists, the workers of civil rights movements, the politicians must come together to entrench democracy. Mr. Governor, a lot of people will agree with you that democracy is actually the best form of government, but what, where the disagreement is is how we practice it. Some have said that we should go back to the parliamentary system of government that we had before. Um, others are saying we should stay with our presidential system, system of government. Where do you lie in that conversation? And I think uh, if you ask me sincerely, I can tell you that uh, we we know what happened. We knew what happened during the uh, parliamentary system as well as the regional uh, settings. And you will agree with me that uh, even at that time, there were a lot of abuses. A lot of people created unnecessary competitions. And of course, uh, that has not also taken us to the promised land. So for me, uh, what are we talking about? Most of us ag agitated for the true federalism. Uh, as someone who fought for the internment of democracy in Nigeria, within the civil rights movement, I can tell you what I believe in is certainly ensuring that we have more powers at the grassroots level. I mean, the local government autonomy is a welcome idea. Uh, devolution of power is also very important. So that is for me. But that can only be achieved. Uh, to present a lot of people are talking about parliamentary system government, but yeah. I can tell you that uh, we have not exhausted you, the parliament, particularly the National Assembly, both the Senate and the House of Reps, must step up. That is the most important thing. Judiciary must also have to do what they need to do. Uh, because if you ask me, a lot of people are complaining about uh, the current situation in the country when people cannot get justice. Uh, a lot of people have approached uh, judiciary, maybe because of their standing in the society. Uh, nobody listened to them, and a lot of people uh, have been complaining about the situation on ground. So for me, uh, a lot of people have their own position, but as someone who was in the National Assembly, who also fought for the democracy, the democracy in Nigeria, I will tell you clearly, that I believe we need to exhaust this very system. I know where we are coming from. We know the experience of the first republic. We know what happened in the first republic. We know actually what happened uh, in the second republic. We know what happened in the third republic when we had uh, a system where half system was military and half was uh, a civil rule. Now we have third republic. So I think uh, we have experiences, but let's not rush into conclusion. That's my position. Yeah, some will even say that as at the federal level, is still the uh, separation of power is still something that is practiced and that is enforced. But for you governors across the states, that the state houses of assembly across you know the federation is like an appendage to the executive branch of government that you guys have not allowed that arm of government to function independently. What is the situation in Kaduna State? Uh, in Kaduna State, it's, it's completely different, maybe because I am also someone who practice, uh, uh, who, let me say, someone who was also a member of the National Assembly in the Ninth Senate, and I also have tremendous experience about the importance of separation of powers and the importance of uh, legislature. Uh, when I was in the Senate, I was given the free hand as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Banking. I know we've done a lot. And of course, uh, on my own, as a legislature, I sponsored about 32 bills. Three of the bills were assented by the president then that have repositioned the financial service sector in Nigeria. And of course, so here as a governor, I believe uh, the most important responsibility of the legislature is to ensure that they of their level in terms of uh, oversight. When I was in the National Assembly, everybody knows what I did. 
uh, most of the institutions or agencies under my committee, I encourage my committee members to ensure that we have uh, oversight functions. We also try as much as possible to uh, look at the budgetary provision and ensure that the budgets are being implemented uh, for the benefit of the people of Nigeria. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I cannot say that uh, a lot of uh, state assemblies uh, in some states are not really working properly, maybe because uh, uh, of the nature of the state. But in Kaduna and many other states, I can also say, uh, I know some governors that have given the state assembly a free hand to us. In Kaduna, uh, we have not actually interfere in their own activities. Uh, we allow them to do what is right. Uh, because we know they are also elected by the people at the grassroots level and they have responsibility to ensure that uh, we do what is right. Uh, that is the reason why if you look at our budget uh, process, you also look at our uh, the way we implement our budget, the State Assembly in Kaduna uh, have been very active in the way we run our government and they have they have also been very active because Kaduna is different. When you look at our State Assembly, about 40% of the members of the assembly are from the opposition uh, political parties. 60% uh, are from the APC. So we allow everyone to express himself and the committees are working properly. That's what happens in uh, Kaduna. And of course, as a former legislator, it is important for me to allow them to work independently because I know the benefits. I know uh, what they are doing is... So you, you have talked about um, exhausting this system of government. One of the reasons people are clamoring. Oh, it's like the governor is still speaking. All right, uh, apologies for interrupting you. but I'm, No, no, no. All right. So you have talked about, you know, exhausting uh, the presidential system of government. One of the reasons people are clamoring, you know, for us to go back to the parliamentary system of government is that they say that in the presidential system of government, men are empowered over institutions and that governors especially have now weaponized um, poverty. And so they keep people down just so that they can get their votes during election. Talk to us about the level of poverty in Kaduna State and what is being done um, by your administration to address it. So thank you very much. I agree with you 100% that uh, a lot of uh, effort must be made by the states. But most importantly, that is the reason why Kaduna said here we are in support of the local government of autonomy, uh, because I know the importance of uh, uh, making sure that uh, development uh, happens at the level of grassroots. That is the only way the people of our state will benefit from the debate of democracy. But when we came in uh, May 29 last year, we look at the poverty uh, index of our state. And I can tell you here, uh, that uh, about 65% uh, of the people that lives within the rural areas of Kaduna State, uh, when we came in, were living before the, below the poverty line. That is a fact. And of course, uh, we sat down with my own team and we looked at the situation. We tried to look at what do we do to address the problem. That was the reason why the first three months, I signed an executive order, knowing fully that uh, those people that were below the poverty line, most of them were financially excluded. And today, as we are speaking, out of the 3.5 million vulnerable, underserved, poor people within the rural areas are now captured by my government, and all of them were on bank when we came in. But today, we open accounts for them, and in the last six months, they have been benefiting from our social intervention support. And that has tremendously improved the level of their economic prosperity. That is number one thing we've done. Number two, we also look at the fact that agriculture contributes about 42.8% uh, of our GDP here in Kaduna. And because of that, we uh, reach out to all the three uh, senatorial zone of Kaduna State, uh, reaching out to smallholder farmers. Don't forget, Kaduna State is leading in ginger in the whole of Nigeria. We are also leading in maize production in the whole of Nigeria. We are also second in soya beans in the whole of Nigeria. So because of that, we know our strength is agriculture. 
So we decided to invest heavily in the area of agriculture. That was the reason why we budgeted over 25 billion in agriculture. And uh, because of that, we supported our smallholder farmers with seedlings, with uh, tractors that uh, supported mechanization and also uh, uh, machineries to support them. And uh, just last month, well, that is about 15,000 metric tons to our smallholder farmers, numbering about 120,000. So that is what we've been doing to support farming in Kaduna State. But don't forget, also we have uh, small businesses that are very important because we know they contribute a lot in terms of employing the people uh, that I've just mentioned who are poor, who are below the poverty line. So we decided to also improve the level of SMEs in Kaduna State using our agency that is Kadeda. And because of that, we supported over 130, uh, about uh, uh, 130,000 households directly and about 7,000 SMEs directly through our intervention. As we are speaking, we are reducing the level of people that are below the poverty line through this social intervention we are doing in Kaduna State. For me, this is key. Governance is about supporting the people so that they can be out of poverty, uh, reducing the level of employment, uh, addressing the problem of education, because for us, education is key in Kaduna State. That is the reason why only last uh, week, we've announced that uh, we have reduced the level of out of school children in Kaduna State. From our own statistics, we realized that in the last one year, we have taken back about 300,000 pupils back to school that were out of school when we came in as a, as a government, because education, like I said, is the greatest level in Kaduna State, and we believe we need to invest a lot in education. Uh, that is even the reason why we budget about 25% of our entire budget to education. Another aspect we believe is key in Kaduna State is healthcare, which we believe is not a privilege, it's a right for everyone in Kaduna State, particularly the children, women, to have free healthcare here in Kaduna State. And as we are speaking, we've equipped about 290 primary health cares. We also remodeled to build and equipped about nine secondary health care centers, hospitals here in Kaduna. We have also recruited and employed more doctors, more nurses, more midwives, because we have to reduce the level of child and maternal mortality rate in Kaduna State, which for us is key to save lives. Uh, that is what we are doing, but not to talk ab about our intervention in other areas, which we believe is key, that is infrastructure. We have embarked on reducing the deficit in terms of infrastructure, infrastructure development between the rural and uh, urban areas of Kaduna State. To that extent, we uh, embark on constructing about 62 roads uh, across the three 23 local governments of Kaduna State. As well as speaking, uh, we have commissioned some of them, and uh, the total number of kilometers, uh, uh, as well as speaking, is about 743 kilometers, uh, as well as speaking. And so for me, is some of the things we are doing as a government. Like I said, uh, state governments have to do a lot. Local governments must also be given opportunity to also participate and have the autonomy that we're all agitating for here in in Nigeria and Kaduna said we believe in that. And uh, since I came as a governor, we have not touched one matter that is meant for local governments here in Kaduna State. Okay, let me, let's talk about poverty in Nigeria now. A lot of people have been talking about, you know, the hardship experience in the course of the policies of this administration. And some people are saying that the box stops on the table of Mr. President while others are saying that, no, that the president has done enough to alleviate poverty, done enough to stem the tide of poverty, but the governors have not really given account of what they've gotten so far from the federation accounts. Uh, let me uh, try to address this issue because uh, sitting here, I've just mentioned what we've done here in Kaduna State as a government. And I can tell you, a lot of state governors are doing their best. Uh, 
I can also tell you clearly that uh, President Bola Metunubu have done tremendously well uh, since he came in uh, last year. Because let's not forget, it's not a matter of blame games. No, we have to call a spare respect. Because you see, we should not try to shy away from where we're coming from. This is here, like I said, uh, a lot of people are speaking without facts, without data, without statistics. Like I said, I covered the financial service sector of our country in the last four years before I became governor. And I was covering about 90% of our financial service sector as the chairman of the Committee on Banking, Insurance, and Financial Institutions. And I can tell you, I know where we're coming from. As of 2023, when President Bola Metinubu was elected as the president of Nigeria, don't forget, there was a program of about 30 trillion printed and was wasted through ways and means, which um, I am is very happy today when Mr. President made it clear to everyone in his own speech that the government have already paid that back. Because that is for me, it's a major problem. When you have a country that is printing money, that was what is causing the problem, this inflation we're facing today in Nigeria. There was a time that nobody can even say the, the amount of naira that was in circulation in Nigeria. The post we lost count of that before Aswaji Bola Metunu became as a president. And don't forget again, people tend to forget this. When I talk about these indices of poverty, uh, I'm just talking about Kaduna State. About 65%, like I said, the rural areas were living below the poverty line. But what of the situation across some region? In Nigeria, is it the northwest? Is it the northeast? Is it the north central? Is it the south south? Is it the southeast? Is it the southwest? I have the statistics. I can tell you, the average of the people that were living before the, below the poverty line when President Bola Metin became, if you look at the, of the people that were living below the poverty line, why do we can has anyone sat down and asked himself why? What really happened? Look, we had opportunities in the past. We are talking about now celebrating independence, you know, but can we be sincere? There was a time we had surplus, but we did not save for the rainy day. Now we find ourselves in this crisis. It was not the problem that was caused by the current government of President Bola Metsudubu. He inherited this problem. But I can tell you, we need time address this problem. Is it the poverty? Is it unemployment? Is it a problem of uh, infrastructural decay and deficit in this country? We have many other problems. Is it healthcare issue? One President Bola Metinobu came last year. Let's see, look, look at the, 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 the progress he made in the area of healthcare. Look at the progress he made in the area of agriculture. I can tell you that. I know the support he gave to the government, but most importantly, I know the policies. Most of them are painful because you have to now come with painful economic decisions to address the problem, the decay, the mismanagement we inherited. And I can tell you, is it the problem of insecurity? Which for me, sitting here as a governor of uh, Kaduna State, I can tell you, the insecurity has affected our farmers, have affected our small businesses. But I can take you back to just 2015. As far as 2015, there was nothing like banditry, kidnappings, insurgencies in northwest of Nigeria. It only started around 2016. We had opportunities to address this problem, but we didn't do anything. Now I can tell you, today, a lot of investors are coming to Nigeria. Many people might not understand that, but they all run away some years ago because of the problem of our multiple exchange rate. People cannot invest in Nigeria, really. Are repatriate. They cannot exit. So people have run away from Nigeria. Now, this current government have now eliminated the multiple essence rate. Yes, I agree. The dollar to naira value is now deteriorating. The, the, our naira. But the truth of the matter is, has anyone sat down and asked why we are facing this problem? So for me, let's be holistic. I know we are heading in the right direction. We don't have to blame anyone. We need to support the current government. I have no doubt in my mind, Nigeria is our country. Let's not publicize this. A lot of people, are, it's all about politics in Nigeria. This is our country. We need to come together. 
we need to support the government. If there's development in Nigeria, we are all going to benefit. So the issue of politics must be healthy, must be responsible, must be reasonable. People shouldn't come as if they were not in government in the past. I'm always surprised when I see people that were in government in the past, some were former governors, some were former ministers, some were former senators, some were former vice presidents, some were former presidents of this country, blaming the current government. And I can tell you, when they were in government, Nigeria had every opportunity to address most of these problems. When I was in China with the president just a few weeks ago, I look at the record as far back as 1970. Our GDP was more than that of China. I can tell you. So why are we at this political situation? Because of mismanagement of the people or the, those that were responsible to now take this country to such a level. They had opportunity, they were leading this country. They mismanaged the resources. They didn't save for the rainy day. I can tell you that. So for me, the blame and, game and was Mr. Governor, if we may we quickly come that. in here. Um, I know you are highlighting the the development and, and what the, the, at the at the federal level and what this president is doing. But people are calling for accountability. My colleague Ayo has spoken to it earlier at the state level, especially mm -hmm. with the increase in allocation mm -hmm. since it's the removal of fuel right. subsidy. Um, they say that whilst the allocation has increased, development mm -hmm. at that level has not increased. I can tell you the development, at, uh, let me speak from my own state. Uh, in Kaduna State, the development has tremendous. Uh, if you have anything to do with economy, I can tell you, you have to know the cost of fund. Cost of fund means if you are constructing a road in the last five years at the rate of 500 million, today you construct the same road at the rate of 1 billion naira. That is a cost of fund. Do you know the economics of that? You have to check. That is why sometimes I want to educate people when they don't understand. Again, some of us, just like uh, the president is talking about paying debt, which is, uh, I think, is, is, is real. We have to agree with that. In Corona said also when I came in, every month I'm paying 4.7 billion debt that I inherited from the previous government. But I'm not complaining. Government is about continuity. We have to pay the debt. Just like federal government are also paying the debt. In Kaduna, we're paying 4.7 billion. If you go and check and see our allocation, you will agree with me. And this debt, we've only started paying in, in June 2023. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that, look, every month in Kaduna State, what we're getting at the moment is about 8.7 billion. And 8.7 billion means we're supposed to have to receive about 12 billion compared to what other states are receiving within the northern Nigeria and also other states around the north. But unfortunately, we have 4.7 billion minus because we have to pay our debt. And these debts are sovereign debts. They are being deducted from the fact allocation. If you go to the management office today, check what Kaduna State government is paying every month. From the foreign debt, is about 4 billion. From the local debt, it's about seven, it's about uh, seven hundred million. So this is the fact. So I'm starting with minus four point seven, but I'm not complaining. We are trying as much as possible to manage what we have today in Kaduna. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, governance is about saving the cost of governance and trying to manage what we have. Since I came as a governor, I kept saying. We have not bought a single vehicle in Kaduna for anyone, whether myself, whether the deputy governor or my commissioners. And again, we have reduced the performance bonuses or the salaries of our commissioners, our deputy governor, and myself today sitting here, I'm only receiving half of my salary. Why? Because we have to make the sacrifice considering the fact that we have this problem. And again, we people can talk about what of our IGR. Again, our IGR account is with the Zanir Bank. You can go and check. Our IGR account is with the Zanir Bank. Every month, Zanir Bank is deducted about 800 million from the source because we also inherited a debt where 
Zenibank must deduct 800 million from our uh, uh, IGR account. And I cannot change that because I inherited that. So as a government, I don't like talking. I don't like mentioning. I don't like complaining. It's simply because they're asking that question. If you don't ask this question, I will not tell anyone because as a governor, the like is the, the resources we have to move the step forward. Mr. Governor, a lot of people will say Nigerians are facing the hardship because of the policy of the removal of subsidy at the same time floating the Naira, you know, by the APC-led administration. That what we are experiencing today, that we've never had it this bad, that the level of poverty and hardship in the country, you as a governor, you know what you are facing in your own states. Are you supporting the two major policy of Mr. President of removing that subsidy the time it removed it and the floating of Naira? Uh, look, let me address this one after the other. The floating of Naira, I, I can tell you uh, 100% I'm in support of that because I, like I said, I'm coming from the financial services sector. I know uh, if you don't do that, you will not create a new competition in the business cycle. And of course, uh, what we used to know is very few people within the country uh, will be supported with forest allocation and majority of the people who are doing joining business, they don't even get opportunity to assess those forests. So for me, uh, if you want to create a healthy competition, you want uh, to support local industries, everyone should go and, 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 and be there. If you want to create a level playing field, then that is what is going to happen. Because if you say you are going to control everything, you allocate forest to whoever you want, even if they will go and do run tripping, that for me is not healthy. So uh, that policy for me, I support it 100%. Then the issue of uh, uh, for the subsidy, I think, and that's a, that's a missing guy. What am I talking about? When we came in, we looked at the situation critically. And I, I can tell you, if you go to all the neighboring African countries, whether, whether West African countries or other countries within Nigeria, uh, bordering Nigeria, you will agree with me. The price of fire today is over 2,000 naira. And I can tell you, a lot of people, or you go to some state, you see a lot of petrol stations, uh, particularly around states that are bordering uh, some countries, some West African countries. And if you are there, I would challenge you to go and find out if they have seen anything for it in the last two months. But this, uh, but virtually, but if you see the report, most of these people, the reason why you don't see petrol in those uh, petrol stations is simply because the people are smuggling most of these petrol to neighboring African countries. And for me, it's something that uh, is also creating a lot of problems because you cannot see the, the foyer. You will go to the queue and you stay there for two, three hours. There's no foyer. There's no availability. Mm -hmm. So whether we like it or not, whether even if you say the price is below, you will never see it. You end up buying the foyer in the black markets. That is number one. And who are benefiting? The smugglers. The few people that will continue to lie about the subsidy. And again, at this critical time, I can tell you, nobody can tell you that how many millions of liters of, of petrol that we are consuming in this country. But people can quickly rush into talking about subsidy. That's the numbers. I can tell you, most of those figures, in terms of the millions of oil uh, that uh, liters we are, we are consuming in this country, is not true. All this subsidy are talking about it has come by some people. I mean, very few powerful Nigerians benefiting on a daily basis, and that is a fact. So for me, I believe, yes, we have to do a lot to push in those of this rule of course subsidy. We need to quickly look at the situation, support the masses of our people, support the poor people, and look at the people that are vulnerable, those that are affected. But the truth of the matter is that in the long run, I have no doubt in my mind, the issue will be addressed.
That is the reason why in Kaduna, knowing fully that there will be effects of this oil removal, and a lot of people who are poor will definitely be affected. That's the reason why we have come with some measures to support the people at the grassroots level. That was the reason why. If you like this kind of content, like, comment, and share.